So hello everybody from my part. Uh, as Kuba said, my name is uh, Josef Burand. I'm working in NCR as a software engineer. I lead a project uh, for cloud-based computing uh, solution that uh, serves data to our mobile applications in real time. Um, the goal of the, of, the, of the presentation is that you will, I will present you the architecture that we had with uh, our solution uh, previously before we use the Microsoft Orleans. We have encountered uh, issues when we scaled out the, the app and then we were forced to address the problems. We found the Microsoft Orleans and then we decided to uh, completely replace the architecture with a new second version. So I will start the presentation by showing you the product that we are working on. So you get an impression what the product is, what is the scale and what are the capabilities. Uh, I will present a little bit the actor model, uh, slightly more, in slightly more extent the Microsoft Orleans. So it will be some introduction for guys you don't know what it is and how to work with it. And in the end, I will show you the new design of, the, of our architecture. Uh, there will be a little of code examples. Uh, there will be no code examples from our solution since that's NCR's property and I'm not allowed to show it to you. Sorry for that. Uh, but I'm allowed to show you the high level architecture. So let's jump into it. Uh, we work in a hospitality business. Uh, when you have a restaurant, you usually have the POS system where your employees, the servers, that serves the, your customers, are putting in orders, uh, putting their discounts, clock in, ins, their shifts when they come into a job, leaves, and etc. Uh, this is created by the NCR, and what we have is a mobile application for restaurant managers or, or restaurant owners or operational uh, managers that are directly in the restaurant. Uh, the application itself shows you the general metrics of how your restaurant performs. It does not, it's not linked only to one restaurant, it can be a restaurant chain. So the scale is from a small restaurant that has like one or two, if you are owner only of one or two restaurants, or if you are a chain like a Wendy's or McDonald's with thousands of restaurants, we support it as well with the application. So you can be the regional manager, and view data from 300 sites at one place. Uh, you can see what, your, what, were, what are your total sales. You can see the number of checks that were issued. You can see the number of employees that are at work. You can see the weather temperature and all this stuff. Uh, you can view and dig in through all the screens to the deepest level, which is the exact check that was issued to a customer. Uh, you can see the summary of payments, like what the vendors were. You can see the graph of uh, how the guests are coming in in particular times. You can, you can see what were the sales, actually what items are most sold, what are the discounts if they were sold in a different prices. You can also check your employees at work. Uh, you can also get alerts when uh, suspicious behavior happens in the restaurant. That means like uh, the employees you have are not always um, fair to you and they are trying to cheat you and rob you. So they are, even with the POS system, they are trying to find a ways how to get money from it. So uh, the system analyzes a suspicious behavior to find uh, this particular things and report that employee to the manager. This is the application we call Pulse Real Time. Uh, it has an applet that's restaurant guard that for the fraud detection. We serve uh, tens of thousands of restaurants with much more users because each restaurant has multiple users. All the data are provided in real time with low latency and of course, from the big scope of restaurants, we receive a big data. So that's like a buzzword, but it's truly like a lot of transactions incoming in seconds. So it's dozens of millions of transactions we receive throughout the day that we need to process in the system. And by the real time, we truly mean the real time, 
that is anything that happens on the POS is displayed and delivered to the mobile phone of the manager within five seconds. So it's pretty impressive application. Actually, there is no competitive application that is able to achieve the same thing. Uh, I got that. Uh, but the point is actually to show you the scale of like what the cap application is supposed to do. So let's jump up into the, into the architecture, the legacy architecture. Um, it's in a cloud. This is the architecture in a cloud with the part that is outside, that's on the left. And it's like a classical three-tier architecture that you will, like the general one. We have the front end layer that's composed of transaction servers and web servers. The web servers are basically the presentation layer that just provides the data to the mobile clients. The transaction servers are the uh, like incoming layer, so that, that's only responsible for receiving transactions from the sites where we have some agent that actually detects the changes and publishes the data to our cloud. Um, the responsibility of the transaction server is to receive the data and store it to the couch base, which is our shared common um, storage. So in a three-tier architecture, you have the levels that are completely stateless. This is this transaction server, web server, and the processing server, which I was not talking about yet. And you have the one storage in where you have the data. That simplifies a lot of stuff because uh, you don't need to synchronize the data everywhere throughout the system. It's just put in one, it's just put in one place. So you need to make sure that the data are consistent, stored, and everything like that in the common storage. So we utilize the Couchbase. It's no SQL database. And the processing uh, is uh, done on the processing servers, which consists of reading the transactions, the new one that were received from the system, from the, from the sites, uh, modifies the aggregated data, which are the checks, uh, some part of the high level summaries, which are uh, beneficial to pre-process because uh, the aggregation on top of them are uh, expensive and not worthy to be done on the web server layer, and uh, store them back to the couch base. When the user then requests, the data, uh, he asks the web server, it reads the data out from the couch base, the needed parts, and composes the requested report. Because it's in real time, the reports are changing every single second. So there is really no way and no meaning of pre-processing all the reports. You basically need to compose them on time. So you just read the source, do the report, and publish it to the, to the phone clients. Uh, to actually optimize some of the parts. We use the write through caching. That means that if we are processing a batch of transactions, we don't need to, uh, we don't need to like read every single part again. If we are reusing the data that we have already saved, which might be needed if you are modifying uh, like the same check, for example, by the batch of the transaction. So you don't need to reread it back from the couch base. We simply do the write through cache. And which I was not talking about, there is also the historical part of the system. So everything that you have received is stored in a, like I would say, lower level or not so fast historical storage. And the customer can request the data from the, from the application by using a calendar option. Uh, the system is pretty similar. Uh, we have the history server, which uh, accepts the data from the POS, again, like when they are finalized. It's stored on the history storage. There is the history processing server that processes them into some pre-calculated data that we are using in our system, which is basically the image on the data we, we have normally in the couch base. And uh, in a case that uh, customer requests the historical data, they are simply either loaded from the history storage if they are not available in Couchbase or caches it temporarily into Couchbase. So the system basically reuses all of the code. Uh, it just uh, offloads the data 
to the second level storage just to save a space in memory that is required for Couchbase. So the problem we have encountered is that when we are adding more servers, the performance is actually not linear increasing, linearly increasing, but um, we actually are getting to a place then adding a server no more adds a performance, which is quite bad because we are not able to serve more customers. Uh, why this is happening? Um, it's, it's the IO operations between the shared storage and all the layers of this multi-tier stateless architecture, which needs to get, read, and write all the data back and there again, that actually slows down the full system. Uh, there is also an overhead of the locking mechanism, which I was not speaking about. And the locking mechanism is required to synchronize the work of the processing servers, because there should be, or there must not be, any server that processes the data for one store uh, twice, basically. You, you don't want to have ser multiple servers or multiple threads that processes one store data. The point is that you will lose the consistency of the data. The transactions in the, in the order that they are coming in has to be processed in the same order they were like, generated on the POS system. Otherwise, you can get some weird behavior. Um, so back to the problem, the locking uh, system is a problem, but not the big one, but the IO is the, is the most biggest one. Since reading the data, deserializing them, because you need to serialize them, obviously, we also, we actually use the binary serialization. We don't use even, uh, not the JSON, because that's no, no, no option, it's too slow. So we use binary serialization, it's like a memory, memory copying uh, to serialize the data for Couchbase, to read the data from the Couchbase. And the time spent on IO operations, serialization and serialization, is 90% of time spent on the CPU work on the servers. 90% of time. So actually, the three-tier cloud architecture, um, it may work for some use cases, but it absolutely does not work for our use case. So as I have already introduced, the problem is that we have a separated logic from the data. Data are in the cloud storage, and the logic is in the servers, and we need to transfer data back and forward. So the, re the solution is simple, to bring the logic with the data together. Simple as that. And if you will go further, you basically found that this idea was already presented in the 70s of a previous century by the actor model. So uh, a little of innovation. The motivation for the actor model uh, was an idea uh, that is not particularly precise in current times, but uh, the current times are getting close to it. So the idea was that you have a physical CPUs that somehow has a communication interface to communicate with other CPUs. You have thousands or dozens of thousands of them. Each of the CPU has its own memory. And basically, no one else is than the CPU has access to that memory. So it's like a private state that the CPU can write and read from. Uh, nowadays, we don't have thousands of CPUs <coughs> if we don't have a, like a processing farms for rendering or whatever. But uh, what we have is a multi-core CPUs. So that pretty self, uh, serves the same purpose. Uh, and by virtualizing the CPUs by object model, we can safely like, map this idea to a class that has just a private state. No one else can access it from outside, so no friends, no protected guys. It's just private state. There is no, you know, inheritance as well. And the only way how to publish the data are through messages, which might be uh, like thought about as a methods that you can call. So you can call a method. It basically 
modifies the internal state potentially, or you get another method that gets you the data. Yeah. That simplifies things a lot, since you don't need to bother yourself like that there are other guys that can potentially touch your internal data. You simply know that your internal data are safe. Uh, if I will show the schema of this actor model, you have a type of the actor, which in our case could be a store, which is basically the restaurant that, that uh, runs the hospitality business. And then you have an instance, which is the direct application like an object, which is uh, defined by a specific key. There is, for example, a store number. And this instance is uh, located on a particular server of your distributed uh, solution. Um, nice idea, but the implementation is pretty tricky because if you would like to implement it from scratch, you need to handle all of the complexities that comes with the distributed systems. That is where I will instantiate that actor if I need to. It's on the server A or server B or where. Uh, how I will ensure that the messages would be actually coming in proper order, how I will uh, handle the job scheduling, because the actors are not allowed to process the, or are not supposed to process the messages asynchronously. They, I mean like uh, concur in, in a concurrent way. They are supposed to process one by one. That ensures actually that you don't need to handle the concurrency inside the actor itself and you don't need to, you don't need to like having concurrent dictionaries or handling the locking inside and everything like that. So it's a pretty tricky question. Uh, also the resource maintenance, you need to like monitor the memory, the CPU utilization, maybe that may be the decision or where you would instantiate. What about the error handling and the recovery? If one server gets failed, you need the instances to be existing and you need to recover them on some other places. All of this, it's complicated. So the good idea, instead of writing it for your own, is to utilize uh, a work of more smarter people than me, maybe also some of you, and utilize some libraries or frameworks that were created for a years by a group of scientists, I would say. So one option is Erlang, which is truly the implementation of the actor model because in its language, the actor model is like incorporated. It's 1986 language, it's functional language, and uh, it does not resolve some, like many parts of the complexities like uh, recovery parts or the instantiation decision, etc. cetera. Uh, for, so getting further in the time, uh, we are in .NET nowadays. There is a interesting framework, ECA.NET, or ACA.NET, not sure on the pronunciation, sorry for that. Um, this one is also closer to the idea of the actor model itself. So you will see that there, if you will look into it, there are truly like messages, serving the messages, and etc. But we will speak about the Microsoft Orleans, which is working on .NET 4.5. Um, just to fill in this list, I would need to write uh, 27 more lines because on Wikipedia you will find that there are actually more than almost, almost or more than 30, 30 frameworks for working with uh, actor model. So Microsoft Orleans, a short introduction. Um, it's created with high scalability, uh, reliability, performance, and uh, development. It's, it's not like super new because the development started uh, six years ago. It was, or it is still, I believe, powering the web part of the Microsoft Halo game starting from 2012, so it is pretty well tested in production on a high scale product. And it targets the common developers. It's not, you don't need to be the scientist, you don't need to understand much of, of what is going behind to enable you start working with that, which is really pretty impressive. No more Bruce Lee. So, 
in a terminology of Orleans, the actor is called a grain. It's like a small part that you are going to use. Um, the schema that we have on the actor model is a little bit different. This is actually the novel approach on the actor model because you will not find this in any other, I believe, any other um, actor model frameworks. The point is that aside to type and instance, there is now the activation. So what does it mean? Again, you have a type, which is a store. You have the instance, which is, again, identified by the particular key. But you also have the activation, which is hosted on the server, on one of the dedicated servers of your distributed system. The instance is local, and it's a proxy to the activation. That means that uh, the existence of the instance is perpetual. It exists every time. You don't need to worry about that if you will request an instance for a particular type, that it would not exist. You don't need to handle the, this, this problem with Orleans. Um, Orleans handles the ex instantiation or activation on the dedicated server automatically if you start sending a messages to the instance, which is the local proxy, and there is no activation. So if there is no activation, he can't find where the activation is, he creates a new one. And there are two types. There is a single activation and stateless activation. You define that by creating the particular type of a grain, so you don't decide this uh, when you call or when you send the message. You, this is decided by the, by the developer who created the particular type of a grain. The difference is that on the single type activation, only one instance exists. It's like a singleton in the whole system for the particular type and a key. The key is important since you can, of course, have multiple instances of the same type, but for one key, you have only one instance. The stateless means that this grain does not have any internal state, so you don't actually care about it much. It's supposed to do some batch work like, I don't know, uh, cal calculate this, and when you have it, then send it to someone else or store it to somewhere. You can fire and forget. You can give it to it, and once it's done, it's done. Uh, for this, the Orleans decides, uh, like, if it's needed to have more activations or if it's enough, the number of activations it already has. So it dynamically scales based on the need and based on the based on the code, how it behaves, the, the amount of activations that is required to run smoothly. And the activation itself, so the location of the activation, is completely transparent to the developer. So you don't know where it is. You don't care. The grain itself, like the code inside the grain, is single-threaded. So you don't need to worry, as we have already said, it's from the actor model. You don't need to worry about the concurrency. It's simply you write the code like it would be single-threaded. But it is using the asynchronous concept or the asynchronous programming from the .NET 4.5. So you are using tasks and you are call, uh, using async and await keywords. So let's check how easy it actually is to create or to define a grain. You do that uh, through the interfaces. The separation of interfaces and implementation is important since the interface is shared with the code that accesses the silo, or the, sorry, the grains, they didn't say the term yet, uh, that accesses the grains from outside the host environment of the Orleans. And the implementation is internal to Orleans, so you don't see it from outside. You define a grain by inheriting from already existing uh, Orleans runtime interfaces. The one here is iGrain with string key. With string key. Yeah. Uh, that actually says the type of a key that you will use. So it can be anything. We use it 
for if it's a store grain, we, for example, use it because our stores have the ID, so we uh, a string ID, so we use it as like that. It can be GUID, whatever. Uh, and then you write down the methods that are going to be public. That is basically the messages in the actor model concept. So this is callable from outside the Orleans or environment and also from inside by other grains. Everything else that is not defined in the interface is private. The implementation itself is done through inheriting from the grain class implementing the, your interface. And there is the public async get check method implementation, of course. There is also the on activate async uh, method that serves as a constructor. This method is called anytime the grain is being activated and you are supposed and allowed to do any job to get the grain to its needed state. It can be the previous state or it can be the zero state, whatever it's needed by your application. And on the client side, that is outside the environment of, or the host of the, of the Orleans uh, runtime environment where the grains are not existing basically and you are accessing them. So you want to do some job or you want to have some input or pass an input there or read something from it. So you basically call a grain factory, um, which is a single, which is like a static class, I would say. Uh, and there is a get grain method where you specify the type through the interface of what type of grain you want. You specify the key, which is here the store ID, and then you are free to call any method that is defined in the interface on it. As we said, the instance of the iStore grain object you get here into a store variable will, will never be now. It's always existing. You don't need to, this, this can like, this call can never throw another reference exception. It's simply working. If it's not instantiated, grain will care. They will do everything for you. So it looks pretty like a single threaded application, but it's distributed through many of servers. And what the, like, I would say nice feature, someone would disagree, is the error propagation. So if something gets wrong in the get check method and it didn't handle the error itself, so like in your normal application, the exception is propagated outside, so you receive it here in your code. So you may watch it when you are developing, uh, you are implementing your methods in a grain that all the exceptions are propagated to the client code if they are not catched properly. And that's everything. So simple. Few things. Uh, I was calling it so far Orleans host environment and whatever. It's, uh, it has its name. It's silo. Grains in silos. So in your data center, you have many of silos, many of machines. Uh, they are all communicating well between each other. The runtime itself running on the silo has its own, just for information, has its own uh, scheduling mechanism. It uh, uses a uh, number of threads that is equal to the number of cores of your CPU. It's one to one by default. You can modify it, but it's by default one to one. And uh, it just uses the asynchronous concept or the asynchronous programming from the .NET that actually on the evade part, it breaks the code there and it continues on a different grains and everything like that. This is everything working. So you are not blocked by a code running in one grain if it uses asynchronous programming properly. It, you can get easily a 100% CPU with that. It also has the multiplex communication between the silos, which means that you do not have a direct communication link between each grain or between each silo, you simply have some communication links established, and then through these links, all the information is optimizedly sent. It also handles the resource management, so it decides, I believe that currently it's random, but uh, there are some approaches on the, or you can, I believe that you can implement your own decision mechanism 
so it decides where it will be instantiated, the grain itself. It handles the recovery, basically automatically by the concept of Orleans, that if any of the silo servers gets down, all the grains that were there, simply the proxy instances still exist, so they are still valid, but when you start calling a messages to them, he says, I can't anymore find the activation, so he creates the new activations on the different servers. And through the onActivate async method, you are allowed, or you are supposed, to actually get the grain into its previous state. So there is, actually you don't lose any data. Um, To find out what is the actually schema of your data center, what silos are there, Orleans is using uh, some silo map tables. Uh, it is implemented through the Azure table. It is implemented through the SQL, or you can provide, you can give it to you, uh, your own provider to it. It's done through, again, some interfaces. So you just implement the interface, define in the config that you want to use this provider, and it will use your provider of for, the, for the silo map tables. The utilization is pretty low. We use the SQL tables in our internal NCR environments. And uh, it's basically used just when the silo fires up, he registered to the table so all the other guys knows what is the map. And if he dies, then it is registered in the table as well. So if he unintentionally fires up, he looked into the table and says, I'm supposed to be dead, so I'm committing a suicide. So it's, it's like trying hard to be consistent a lot. Um, to fire up a silo, it's also quite simple. I've just extracted this. This code is probably somewhere in a service. It's spread it across few methods, but it doesn't matter. It's pretty, you can write it down in this way because it's understandable. You create a silo host object. You call, you, you define where is the XML config or you can pr configure it manually if you want to. You basically call load Orleans config, then initialize Orlean silo, then start Orlean silo and everything happens in background. It reads the DLLs that is next to that executable or in a given directory. This DL contains the interfaces that you have where you have this defined your grains. It contains the implementation, which is private to the silo itself. And it gets everything together and say, OK, I know this type of grains. They have these activations, and I'm running. It actually does not do anything until you start communicating with from the clients from outside. Or you didn't get some scheduled jobs inside, which is like not the intended way how to use it. Uh, killing the silo is like, again, stop all in silo and the, the object itself is uh, disposable. Um, you need to do some work on the client side as well. So you actually need to instantiate the connection to the silos or to one of the silo. So you call similar way, grain client initialize, you provide a config which tells what type of the silo map you want to use. So if it's a SQL, you define the SQL server and where the database and the table is and basically it handles everything like that. Uh, then you can verify if the client is initialized. So if you have the connection and everything is fine, if everything is fine, you can start calling the grain factory get grain methods. You will get them. If it's not initialized, you will get an error. So uh, there is some, um, I would say, boilerplate code that you would need to put in or you can have some wrappers that you would create for you to easy to make your job more easier and in the end you can call uninitialize or if you know that you need to restart or something gets wrong you don't know what happens you can call uninitialize reinitialize whatever uh, there are a few more things in Orleans it, like so far it's like pretty awesome but uh, it's does not like from what all I have said it does not do much. It's just like calling methods and they do all the background, which is like a, like a lot of job, but it, there is more in Orleans. The first thing you may want to is to persist the state. This is actually what you will need to do if you want to 
recover and you want to put the grain into its previous state if something gets wrong and you are reactivated. So you can have the grain state persisted. This is run through a separate class that implements the grain state interface or maybe sh uh, inherits from the uh, like some markup grain state class they have changed this in a recent version, so I don't actually remember what is the particular style now, but you defi it's definitely a private thing, so it's not published outside. And you have the storage providers. The storage provider is an implementation of iStorage provider of Orleans that to which is given an object, a grain state object, of which you are supposed to serialize somehow and store it somewhere. And when you are asked to receive, to like set the given state at to some uh, point, you are also supposed to read it from somewhere, deserialize it somehow and restore the state. So there are quite a few methods in it, only two or three. And uh, you can store the grain states anywhere you want. It can be SQL table. We store it in Couchbase. You can decide to store it on a, on a hard drive, wherever you want to. Um, the next thing is timers and reminders. It's timed jobs. The difference between the timer and reminder is that timer is per grain state exists per grain state so if inside a grain you want to um, schedule an operation that is not related to any outside action or not related to to the messages coming in you can schedule a timer that will exist only in, for a time that the grain exists so if the grain gets deallocated or the silo finishes the timer dies with it the reminder is scheduled on a runtime level, so it's basically a scheduled job for the whole silo. So if you create a reminder for a particular grain and the grain doesn't exist, there is no activation for it, it will be created. And there are also, as a new thing from version 1.1, maybe 1.0, stream providers. And this allows you to reduce the boilerplate code, boiler, boilerplate code that you require to write if you want to consume some data from a stream without the stream providers. So in our system, as I will show you soon, we are consuming notifications from RabbitMQ and for this we need a separate service that actually is attached to that RabbitMQ it's like subscribed, he received a notification, and based on that, he calls some method in Orleans. So it translates the notifications to Orleans messages. The stream providers does that automatically. You can write, again, your own, or there are some pre-created for Azure queue or Kafka message queues. The Orleans itself is open source. You can use it, modify it freely if you want to. You can also commit some changes into it. Uh, the source documentation, which I suggest you to look in, there are also the tutorials, so that's why the introduction is so short, because the, there are a lot more in Orleans. It's on githubcom.net Orleans. And if you are super curious on how it is working, or how it was working originally, uh, there is the Orleans Distributed Virtual Actors for Programmability and Scalability technical work uh, that's like the science stuff. So now is the time to show you how we use Orleans in our new system. As I have introduced, we have a notification queue that tells us that something happened, something changed in a particular site, in a particular store. So this part is pretty the same. We have left what was based, like more or less working. So we have the couch based storage for the incoming transactions, nothing else, just the incoming transactions. So the transaction server was, is 
pretty fast because he just receives and stores and above that he sends the notification to the queue to tell something has changed in the store. On the other part, as I have also introduced, we have the processing invoker, which is a stateless guy who just is subscribed to that notification queue. He, when he receives a notification, he calls, he triggers an operation on a store grain. The store grain is a memory representation of one store because the store itself is mutable. He doesn't touch to other stores, but the store itself is mutable. It changes their, its data frequently. Uh, the couch base here is not that the store grain is storing something into couch base. He is reading the transactions that are at some point too big to be transferred through the queue because uh, the transaction can be a small bit or it can contain a whole day of data. It's like a dynamic uh, format, I would say. So by this, we have re significantly reduced the IO operations. We have just one direction communication and the reduction is so significant that through the four gigabit line we are able to push data of three millions of sites, which is too much over of the size that we currently have. So it's prepared for the future, the bright future of NCR. This is a graph that compares the processing time spent on transaction processing. The dotted line or dashed line is the old system in which is calculated the serialization and deserialization of the transactions. And as you can see, by the number of process transactions, the system is slower and slower because he has more data to read, deserialize, serialize, and store from the couch base. So when it gets larger, the store context, basically, that is stored in the couch base in the old system, gets larger. It, at the part of the data is also larger. The checks get larger and some summaries get larger or whatever. So it gets lower. Since in Orleans, everything is stored in a memory, we don't do any serialization. So everything that we were previously modifying in couch base remotely, we are doing it just in memory. There is a constant time of processing regardless of how many transactions you have already processed. So you are not saving data on some uh, No, right? no. We have permanently stored the transactions mm -hmm. and by this 0, 0.00 something uh, milliseconds to process one transaction, we can safely restore the state of a grain by rereading all the transactions that were so far received and process them all in one at the activation of a grain, which took at maximum of a half of a second. So it's completely uh, opposite idea than data warehouse. Yes. So we are, what is, what is super important for us is the transactions. That has to be collected because it's pretty hard to get them again. But if we have the transactions, that's the source. And processing the source is super fast. So when it's super fast, it's also super simple to restore the grain state. We can simply process the transactions. As we were processing them one, one after another, we can process them all in one by, by the same mechanism. And on the side of the presenter, when the user requests some data from the phone, it again asks the web server. It reaches to the silo, to the particular store grain to which it relates, or to multiple store grains, if it relates to multiple sites. That is, if you want some aggregation for across the company. But everything is re like re processed asynchronously. So you fire up like 100 requests to 100 grains, and all the data are processed on the silo servers asynchronously, and then they receive quite quickly. So you do a little of messaging, which is basically the request. You do a lot of processing, of CPU work uh, on the grain side that is aggregating the data. And then you publish just the amount of data that you were requested to the web server. So it's again reducing the network communication significantly. Uh, we don't basically have any pre-calculated summaries in the, store, on the, in the store grain. We calculate everything 
over and over and over again when you request the data just in the particular time. The example is the labor cost. Your employees are at work and every single second and millisecond they are longer and longer at work and you are paying them more and more and more. So if you request, you simply can't have pre-calculated value. You can calculate them like maybe on a 15 minute basis if you want to have some like staging system, but we do it on time. That's that's why it's real time. That's why it's like in few seconds on your phone. That's not anything that is static and advancing through some stages. So, uh, because that was pretty much high level, so I have some simplified version of the grain here. Uh, that is like how the process works inside a little bit. Uh, here the store context is in memory. I just show it as a storage because it is basically like the private storage of the grain. We store into the store context object everything that we have received. We aggregate there the checks, the labor, and all the, all the, all the data. Um, when you, you the, the interface, the public interface grain has basically two types of methods. Uh, the one type of the method has actually, is actually represented by only a one method and that's the update method. This is used by the processing invoker to tell the grain something has changed. It doesn't tell anything more. It just say, check out that store. Something may happen there. He tries to verify that information from the transaction storage. So he knows by the store context what he already processed. He knows how many transactions he processed. So he can say, okay, I have processed 1,000 transactions. So is there anything new? Yes, here are 10 transactions. Okay, pass to the processing core, modify the internal state, done. If the internal state is not existing, we create the internal state as an empty one, which is pretty simple. And that ends here. Now, at some, like in a concurrent way, in parallel to this, a client on the phone is requesting a data. So it calls the data access methods, it triggers the computing core, which accesses the store context, and because everything is like single-threaded in the grain, we don't need to care about the modification of the data that is happening at the same time as the users are requesting, because this is handled by the Orleans. So no problem, it's easy. We read the data, we do the heavy computation here, aggregations, whatever is needed, and pass the result back to the client. Cool. Actually, it has a one problem. <laughs> now, when we have the data in RAM, it's pretty costly. You actually need to have the references stored in the memory. The classes has a big overhead and everything like that. So actually when we just did this, it's like five times more memory, con or four times, five times more memory consumption than it was before. That actually means that instead of 20 servers, you need 100 of servers. This is something that management doesn't like. It's a costly solution. No way how to, how to do that. The old system was better, it's cheaper. So, again, we can delete everything and return to the old one. Nope. Memory optimizations in C sharp. It's possible, doable. So, first of all, define if you need a class or a structure is enough. Simple as that. The structure itself has a big overhead. Is the class header, the methods, map, and everything like that. Um, and then there is the interning values. Maybe it's pretty uh, hideous word. Uh, it's based on knowing what type of data we are working with. So it might not be usable in all cases, but uh, the point here is that if you you need to know what type of data you are processing so you can find uh, your own memory optimizations part uh, on your own data. Uh, in our case, people are in restaurants are ordering over and over, like there, there are, let's say, 300 of items. And they are ordering them over and over again. It's like 
thousands of burgers sent every day, uh, sell, sell, sold, sold, sell, whatever, sold every day. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we don't need, or actually it's, it's a bad idea to just receive the transaction information that a new item was sold uh, and just like deserialize the data. We receive the item ID and the item name, which is the strings, and to store this just into the store context. It's silly because we have now a new string class this string is a class, we have new string object that is actually holding the same name as the other 1,000 of the same instances which hold the same data, but each of them is a separate instance. This is eating a lot of memory. So what you can do, or what we are doing in this case, is that we have a dictionary of this strings that we completely reuse, and we get further, it's no more a strings, it's the full object. It's like the definition of uh, to, which to which categories the item belongs. Like the burger belongs to a food category, it, be it belongs to an unhealthy category or whatever. So uh, all of this we cache in a dictionary. If we receive a data, we check the dictionary if it's, like has the s if it's equal, the if there is some value that equals, if it does, we basically throw away what we have received and we reduce that instance. And by this, we get a lot close to what we had previously. It's like just 20% overhead. That's acceptable. Instead of 10 servers, you just need 11. Instead of 20, you have 22. Mm -hmm. uh, at runs, uh, no virtual tables and things like that. But on the other hand, uh, when you uh, when you call some function, the data are copied uh, instead of uh, class stay in, in, in one place. Yes. Anyway. So we like to say that. Uh, the point is that uh, the data are always there. We know that particular data, like each item, has a name and ID. This can be, this is a labeled ID structure. It has to have it, otherwise it's an invalid object. So we know that it would always be there and it's unworthy to store it as a class because every single item has its own. So far there's not a problem with the partition because it's some kind of synthroid, but it's the same, all this in the memory. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, the memory uh, consumption is the problem you will probably face if you are going to hold a big data in the memory, not the CPU. The CPU without serialization deserialization is so fast that currently in a, in a demo store we have like 100 sites or something in, in, a, in, a, in a demo uh, running like some pilot state. It's 100 sites and there is 0 0.2 CPU utilization. It's like not doing anything, basically. It's eating a few of memory, of course. And with this, uh, it's, it's, it's done. This is how it works. I I've haven't said uh, how the history works, which is something that you may be asking. On the beginning, I've said that the history is basically a copy implementation of the real-time processing. In this case, Kind of, yes, but not as stream, streamlined. So uh, we actually ended in having two types of grains. We have the public grain, which is accessible from the clients, and we have the internal grain, which is unknown to the outer world. We basically did it through the interface that is defined in a different DLL, which is just linked in the silo, and no one else is uh, like using it. Uh, here we utilize some caching because the store context itself holding all the data is costly. It's few megabytes per store, thousands of stores is several dozens of gigabytes per silo which is like 
not, not, not acceptable. It would eat the space for what we need to do is the real-time processing. The history is just like some addition. We need some data for uh, forecasting that we do in real time. So in real time, every single second, the forecast of your like sales that you will achieve today is changed. And for this, we need some specific subset of data that we already have. So we keep it in the cache, which is like 20% of the size of the store context in this history, history store grain. And if you need something deeper, like a check detail, which is triggered by a user from the phone, more or likely, because anyone who is hooked on the system from outside has already processed, processed all the checks that we have in history because they are hooked on the real-time processing as well. So the history is truly like for a user that he can review what happened. Or if he receives a fraud alert, he can check like the next day how the check looked like a day before. So in this case, we ask the internal crane, which holds all the store context. The trick is here, it, it has the processor, it has the access to the history storage where the historical data are saved. And in a case that he is not instantiated, he doesn't have the data processed yet, he processes them and then returns the result. So here it comes again, the fast processing uh, thing that we have, that it costs only like uh, dozens of milliseconds to process the whole day. So we can afford that design. And this internal history store grain it lasted only for a few minutes. So if no one is assessing it, that's a future. Next thing, it was not on a slide. You can define for each type of a grain a deactivation time or basically a lifespan time, which means that if no one is using this particular instance of a grain, after a defined time, it would be deactivated automatically. So we have like a 15 minutes deactivation time for the internal historical store grain. And we have like 32 hours on this guy, which can be prolonged up to seven days or week or month or whatever, if it's continuously utilized by the forecasting mechanism. So it loads the data once at a time. It allows the cache to keep the data that is needed. And then it flies away and frees the space for the other historical calculations. <sighs> okay, it's that. It was the old architecture. Now we have the new architecture. We are just starting up. We have a good result, all achieved by the Microsoft Orleans, thanks to that, because we were able to focus on the implementation of the solution that we are supposed to create. We were focused on doing the processing, gathering the data, everything that is related to our job. We didn't need to bother ourselves with the concurrency problems and all the hard parts that is, that is needed in distributed uh, computation systems. Again, the documentation. And uh, you can also, you are free to send me an email if you have any questions later. Now QA and session if you have some questions. Yes. Yes, uh, they did. Uh, there was a big change between 0 0.9 version and 1.0 ver 1 version, and also a big change in 1.1 version. It's, uh, it didn't cost as much time to update the software. It's like a matter of half a day, maybe two hours, or something like that. It's uh, more like a changing the interfaces. Sometimes it's changed a logging concept. Sometimes it's, well, it was changing the uh, state concepts, but but overall it works the same way. So it's pretty easy to just adapt or change a little bit here, a little bit there. Ah, oh, sorry. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, it doesn't change for us. 
uh, the trick with the old architecture was that uh, we have the binary serialization. It's, we have their versioning there, but it was like uh, backward compatible with the previous data stored. But we didn't have a forward compatibility since it's uh, slow. And we already have 90% of time spent on serialization and serialization, so we didn't want to spend it even more on handling the forward compatibility. So our deployment cycles was like shut everything down, release it, and then start it back. Uh, this, this actually was some downtime, but you can solve that by having a mirror uh, running solution with, to which you just switch the load balancers that are serving the client. So they are provided by the old system, which is able to like it's consuming this data in parallel, then you switch it to the new one. Uh, but we need to turn everything down since we do the big upgrade and the old binaries, like the old executables, are not compatible with the new data formats. And with the Orleans, uh, we currently are on the same schema since it's simple. We basically switch down the silos, update the binaries, fire it up again, and because we are processing on demand. So if some new transactions appears, it triggers the store grain instantiation activation. So it's not one at a time. Or when a user uh, requests the data from the client, it again triggers the, the grain activation. So it's not all in one that needs to be fired up and processed. It's like, again, like somehow somewhat uh, throttled by the utilization. It was a killing presentation. No one has uh, another questions. Uh, have you ever faced a problem like, uh, if I understand it correctly, you get a notification that this is on data for your search, uh -huh. and then you activate the network activation. Yes. So if the search becomes unavailable, uh, the, uh, the grain is effectively blocked for the that API you have. Uh, not precisely. If the Couchbase servers are unaccessible, then we didn't receive any data. It's like kicked back quite quickly. So we didn't, we just uh, keep it in the state as it is because we can't update. And it would not even retry. It waits up to the next uh, update, like ne next notification. And because the system that stores the transactions is also using Couchbase. If it's unaccessible, it doesn't produce any notifications. And that is preventing the agents in the sites to actually push any data because the, the, the data we are sent is verified in all cases. So actually the data are being cached on the store side. Once the system is back online, it pushes the data through. Yeah, uh, the, we don't have re-entrant grains, but uh, the reading is asynchronous from Couchbase. So the method, you can't read a second time in a grain, but it doesn't prevent the grain to actually enter another method if it's, if it's okay. It, the re-entrancy means that you can re-enter re the same method several times. It's, uh, I believe that it's in the documentation. I have read it several times. There is some confusion on how this might be. I might be wrong, not saying that on 100% sure. I'm like 80% sure on that. Uh, I remember it's in, it's in the documentation says that I was like checking what the rent run means. It's like the grain is just truly like blocking everything else or is it like, what does it mean? And the rent run, you can, you can uh, mark the grain as rent run. That means that, the, so I, as I believe it, it means that the one method of a grain can be executed multiple times. If the clients are requesting the single activation for the same method, it can be re-entered several times. But if you don't provide a grain re entrant this doesn't mean that uh, other methods are not callable. This is handled by the scheduling, job scheduling in the, in the, in the Orleans. Mm -hmm. We reinforced our code against this, against this sort of pro problem, and when I did the test, uh, it looked like it was working. Um, 
the, the trick is that it has to be asynchronous. And then, then there is also a trick in the testing application. For example, in the UI application, the, yeah. if, you don't have, if you are not having the, application, the UI application uh, asynchronous and your event handlers are normal void returning methods, then you get a deadlock on a Orleans calls because it uses the synchronization context the same as the application is running in. So it is some tricky behavior. I'm not uh, saying definitely that it's this way, but this is uh, how I updated myself with the understanding of how it works, how the reentrancy and non reentrancy works. If I'm wrong, uh, I would be, I would recheck that definitely. Okay, yep. How does system survive when somebody, when some big company wants to uh, some storage data for, uh, for two years backwards? This is not the use case that we have. So uh, we have a history for a one year and it's available uh, by, from the user's phone. So he basically can request the stores that are, that he has access to. The users have generally, like the big one have like maybe hundreds of sites which actually active, if the history is not there, it activates 100s of grains that triggers reading the 100 of historical data and processes them asynchronously. So it's like that. The user will need to wait. Of course, there is a case when the historical data are not available. There is a mechanism that we send a request to the site that we want the historical data. And in this case, the user has to wait for a long, longer time because he is requesting data, for example, from a period that, uh, we, that the store was not connected to our system yet. But so this, is, this is like automatically handled. Uh, each grain has a time boundary on how long the method can run, but it's a per grain. So if you fire up 1,000 of grain at one time, it's like, okay, if it would uh, like pass in the, in the appropriate time to process the methods. We don't have, we are not in this, in this state yet. We were not uh, experiencing the, this problem yet. We, don't, we are not in the scale now uh, of the pilot, uh, but we know that the use case is not that the, that the customers are not requesting the historical data uh, from our external APIs through which they can read. The core of the feature is like the real time data flow because uh, like with the old system, and I believe that many of the systems is the same way. If you miss a particular time frame and you are held back of the real time, you are never able to catch up because the data are incoming in such a rate that it's very hard to catch up the real time again. This, with this system, it's easier because the processing is so fast. But the old system has this problem. We have a last year only, so the, the application does not, that does not, doesn't use the range of, uh, of a years, yeah. No, we don't have this throttling and there is no way how the manager can request that because we don't provide this type of uh, service. So it's not designed, it's not designed for this. <laughs> we don't have it for in the old system. We didn't, uh, we didn't uh, encounter it in the, in the new one. So, yeah. Uh, I believe no. Uh, you are allowed to modif like interchange the implementation binaries dynamically, uh, so the Orleans is supposed to somehow like reload it. I was not testing that, so my uh, like understanding of this part is pretty vague. Uh, 
No, it's the full DLL package. So uh, here again, the, the way probably how we are going to do that is switching the en two environments that are running like a par or, or as a mirror. So you can fire up the backup. Uh, it, it gets to some valid point, then you switch the users there and then change the new one and then switch them back. So then it, that, that's the basically zero uh, time of the unavailability in this case. Uh, no, definitely not. The versioning is a hell yeah. for us and for everyone probably. So uh, we do it for the public thing. We have the, the public thing is the web services. So it's uh, not nice. It's some boilerplate, but it's, it's easier to version the REST APIs than some binary formats or whatever. So that's why we deploy the full system because of course, uh, if you have interface DLLs on the client side, not the same as in the grain, they will not communicate with each other and you will have, you will have crashes. So uh, you need to have everything at the same time at this, in the same version. So we don't, we don't do any versioning in that. That actually simplifies a lot of stuff and allows you to focus on what is important because it adds bugs, a lot of bugs. No, uh, the, it's the, it's the, this is already in the Orleans runtime. Yeah. So you have the client, the Orleans client library, which is the Orleans DLL. You use it in your client code. You use the singleton class to in initialize the client that connects to the silo. It reads the map from the SQL or from the Azure table or everything. It establishes the connection. And then when you send a request, it ha it's handled by the runtime on the silo. So it's a, I need this grain activation. It's a, I don't know anyone. So I create it and everything like that. This is handled by the Orlean. So uh, in the detail, how precisely the procedure is, I don't know. I was not yet reading this technical spec, but you are free to do that. It's, the, 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 the thing is that we were not need to know that to actually have the working solution, which is the goal of the Orleans. It's targeted for the general common programmers that does not need to understand the problems of the distributed systems. We were having our own distributed system, which was, as I said, as I show off on the beginning, pretty capable that after four years, there is still no competitor that has this real time capability, but it has its limitations. And with Orleans, it looks much, much better for now. It, I'm not saying that there will be no problems because there are always problems. There are transfers from one part to another, but uh, these problems are of a different type. <laughs> so uh, it's unknown to us yet. The, yeah. Are you doing some documentation for that? Yeah, yeah. I don't have it in this presentation. I'm not sure if I was, I uh, have some data in the documentation. I may check. I'm going to try to oh, I'll try to find some. Uh, just give me a f uh, 20 seconds, I would say. Ah, take your task. Okay. Uh, okay, sorry, I don't have it here. I will check one more. Huh. Nope. One more. Okay, I will try to open this line, this guy. I'm not sure if it will open. Uh, 
uh, this is the full specification of the solution, which is a little bit outdated, but I will scroll to the, I hope that this one is there. Uh, this is just, uh, yeah, here. So, what was it? Okay. okay. Ha, the, I don't know the numbers. Awesome. So, this is the word for Mac, and it doesn't work perfectly. But uh, this is some extraction of the data that we have measured. Um, the hidden parts are, I would like to show it to you. I don't have the PDF dug here, it's on my desktop machine which is on a different folder, I don't have shared, so whatever. Uh, the point is, I zoom it, okay, I will try this, at least this part. Ah, I think, okay, okay, I don't see any of it. Huh, not, not this one, unfortunately. I don't know why it's not working. Crazy, stupid, sorry. Uh, Basically, we have measured the all system. We have measured how much transactions we are sending in average from the sites. We take the uh, higher average values, and uh, we have calculated this is how I get the 0 0.13 kilobytes per second of network uh, traffic that is required for real-time processing. <coughs> we also have the average millisecond with two transaction average deserialization time. Yeah, so you, of course we receive the data in protobuffer, so we need to deserialize them, but uh, the data are small and we deserialize them just once. We, don't, we are not storing the data there into the couch base or somewhere uh, when we are modifying them. So we need to receive the transaction itself and then everything is happening in the, in the memory. So then it's just a measurement of how long it takes to apply the transaction on the store context which is what we have measured as well, and this is how we get to the numbers, how many sites we can handle in the, on the silo. No, 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 no. For sending the data from the site, where is no Orleans, oh, yeah, right. uh, we do the protobufs, okay. then we, the, those are stored in Couchbase, once we get the notification, we download, the serialize, and at this point everything is in memory. Yeah. So then it's just the CPU work, and this is how I get to the dozens of milliseconds, because uh, it's the amount of transactions and the average time spent on processing one transaction that gets to four damn big sites, like 300 milliseconds or something. Mm. Then uh, in the old one or in the new one? Uh, you showed us two graphs. That the first one was a very nice implementation with the, with the high visualization for the, for the very personal connectivity with the OS. And then you did some experimental uh -huh. with it. And you observed some, let's say, how higher numbers for the garbage collector. Uh, yeah, I got an answer, uh, question. The answer uh, would be tricky because actually the uh, graph of the naive implementation was done after the imp uh, like uh, optimization because we were smart enough to actually know that it would cost us a lot of memory so we did the optimization before and for just the purpose of the presentation I removed it so I don't have your data. <laughs> yeah, uh, we see we have a uh, like uh, or the the measurement of the performance what we have on production that might be interesting we use the performance counters. Orleans has a dozen of them. We have a Zebex for that, which might not be the best option, but this is what we are provided with uh, our data center operators. And these performance counters are basically put in the graphs. So we can, what we are monitoring is the CPU and memory, which is the most uh, important like uh, attribute. Uh, if we get low on memory, we need to add servers. If we get high on CPU, we need to add servers. Basically, uh, the memory for us is the most important because the CPU utilization will be uh, in the amount, in the extent of how many of data we need to store in memory will be always low. Uh, then we have some performance counters on how many grains we have instantiated, so we can see how they are being then, like they, they initialized, they allocated, deleted. If there are some Orleans. Uh, invoked the activations and stuff like that. 
So if the system is working well, then you have no Orleans deactivations trigger because uh, everything is scheduled, everything is working. You have no, no need to s move grains, activations between silos and etc. Uh, and we are monitoring the memory so we see how the garbage collector there is working and what is the invocations there. And the detailed statistics are in the logs. Uh, you have also an option to publish those uh, statistics of the, like the detailed statistics that doesn't fit into some graphs uh, to the Azure tables or SQL table or whatever. So like uh, from, the, from the testing run, we are like, the, we don't see the garbage collector. Actually, w when we see the garbage collector in action is when someone is starting to read the history. At this point, the memory usually gets, uh, like the free memory gets, uh, we get more free memory uh, because so far the garbage collector was idle. And in a case when you start firing, reading all this historical data at uh, like a short time period, the garbage collector gets into an action and the memory gets freed. So uh, we are like currently somewhere around 80 to 85 percent of free memory with uh, 50 sites. This is, uh, no, this is calculated for, for the uh, width of a line, like a bandwidth. So, uh, because the problem we had is the network capacity. With the old solution, sending and reading the, all the data eats a lot of uh, network traffic. Like so much that, we, sorry, we were several times requesting uh, increasing the bandwidth. We are so currently like on several maybe dozens of gigabytes of the network lines and uh, now it's pretty stable but uh, it, it is one point which is often overseen that no one cares about it like if you have a dedic like a one shared storage that you actually need to transfer the data to the network and if the demand for the data is too big then you simply may not have the bandwidth simply as that so uh, it was one point that it was our interest is what would be the network utilization with the new system and since everything is kept in the memory like it was in the couch base and the uh, uh, footprint is basically the same then uh, artificially calculated taking the higher average of the what, what sites are producing what kind of data uh, we know that we can fit with three millions of sites in four gigabit line. Mm -hmm. Is there something similar uh, to this philosophy in Orleans? I mean, for example, if you request uh, instance uh, and if the initialization fails, uh -huh. for example, you request the data from store and you fail to use from host because there was some format error, initialization error, or whatever. If the, if the, yeah. Uh, Okay, I will open the presentation. Uh, there was some slightly points to it, so it will be easier to show it with that. Uh, oh, what? No? Ah, it's the end. Uh, okay, so. One of the one of one of it is is this one. So I will just it, it, it short. Uh, you have the proxy object in the on the client or in a grain. It, it doesn't matter where you are calling or accessing a grain. Uh, you immediately have a grain client initialized inside a silo host. So you don't need to go through the process of firing up the or instantiating the initialization of a grain client if you are in a silo environment. Uh, you need to do it when you are outside. So. If you ask for a grain, you get the instance, which is the proxy object. If, if the activation is not existing, it calls the uh, onActivate async. If something fails in this method, it's not handled, 
fires the exception that I cannot get to any reasonable state, this exception is propagated to the caller. So you need to then handle it. It's not the null, null reference exception, like the, this instance exists, it's an exception thrown from, the, from that method, like from that method. So then you need to behave like, okay, I didn't receive the check and something gets really wrong, that the code that I have implemented or someone has implemented actually is not able to give it to me. If it is somehow uh, possible to get into any reasonable state and it should be handled in unactivated async, then the activation would not fail because it would fail only in a case that you have no silo at all. That is like there is absolutely no server running or lins, then you simply can't have any grain activation. But in all other cases, you will always get something like it would always get messaged and activated and published. So it's ensured and all the errors are propagated to the caller if not handled inside the environment, inside the code. Like if you write a normal application, you know, you have a method, you, if you don't write a try catch, you uh, try to copy a file, the file already exists, you didn't write over, write through, it fires an exception. If you didn't catch it, then it gets propagated. It's the same behavior. Huh, okay, one more. Uh, what about unit testing? How do you unit test the um, We don't test the logic uh, of the grains because there is just a call to the, to, to the other libraries that are uh, not related to the Orleans at all, and we test these libraries. So there is a possible part of untested code like, but it's more likely a behavioral testing or integration testing, which you can understand. There is no, not much of basically zero logic in the, in the grain code itself. Everything is handled by the underlying libraries. Like the processing, computation of all the summaries and everything like that. I have no idea. We were not trying. We were just, we, we choose the way that uh, we have the, this libraries that we put together. The reason for that is that <coughs> the code that we have uh, distributed across the environment, we also have a tool that is everything put in together and we can easily, when we are developing something, we can easily track all the steps, how it goes. And, and so it's just like, we already use the libraries on many places. Basically, one implementation, actually, we have some uh, agent on a store side, which does also have all the code that we have on the cloud side, just to verify that the processing runs uh, ex as expected and produces the expected data, which is compared on the site level. So then, the, you know, it's just for testing. So we are reusing the code a lot. And uh, this uh, grain is just like a tiny, uh, wrapper or well, like host on top of that that basically calls through that thing. So it would be a behavioral testing which we are not doing here. For behavioral testing we have automated tests in QA environment. It tests that the feature is working like all together so that appropriate things are happening at appropriate time. Cool. <laughs> uh, we didn't get to that number yet. So the answer is no, it's unknown to us. Uh, from the documentation, it's uh, recommended to not have like more than dozens of millions of grains, as I remember. So that means like with the memory consumption that we expect, we would be able with a reasonable amount of memory given to the one processing server. Uh, that means that <clears throat> if you have a big guy as a one silo server that has, let's say, 120 gigs of memory, 
if these guys get down, it, that means that you need to distribute its 120 gigs to the other servers, which is really bad. So we are prefer to have smaller size memories that is easier to actually fire up. So on the one silo, we are about to have 1,500 sites hosted only, which is 1,500 5, 1, grains with few history grains maybe for that sites or the other sites or whatever. Uh, so we need to scale the, to, the, to the wide a lot uh, for the memory reasons. So we are not getting to the uh, number of activations of, on one silo. Don't know what you are talking about. <laughs> Sorry, don't know that. Uh huh. Uh, Interesting. Which is, uh, well, the API looks pretty similar to ODE, but its uh, internals I assume will be more different. Uh, so if you don't, know about don't know them, I will check that. Uh, it depends. It seems like you are uh, basing your notions in your own data center. Yes. And it's on Azure. Azure. Got it. So it's like a microservice for. Uh, for the so you don't need to have the virtual machine with all links you can use the service fabric uh, sure created got it uh, yeah so we are currently required to host it in our solution because of the uh, data security and policies that are like agreements between the customers and NCR or whatever. Well, good to know, thank you. So security, uh, sorry, uh, service, fabric. service fabrics may be of your interest as well. <laughs> uh, okay, if that's not all, not I will good. answer one more question. Cool, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for your attendance.